day in Manhattan Clear as could be Till the planes hit the buildings And changed history They stood for an hour Once the damage was done But then suddenly crumbled Ten seconds they were gone There were cascading projections of steel into dust Looked like explosions, but it was not discussed. So I turn off the TV and shut out the lights. It's all just illusion right in front of my eyes. Drop the cleanest of all Yet the world still knows nothing Of this amazing free fall There was no real reason It wasn't hit by a plane They say it was a fire Yet you can't see the flame Cascading projections of steel into dust Looks like demolition, but it's never discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes The bigger the lie, the more people believe And the deeper the fear, the more easily we are deceived I Turn off the TV And I shut out the lies It's all just illusion Hello, I'm Bill Olson, host of 9-11 was an inside job and other state crimes against democracy. Today we're going to change that to state crimes against decency when we talk about Israel. But before we get on to that, the part of the show today that's going to be connected to 9-11 uh, involves this crash of the Malaysian crash, the, the, the destruction, the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner. and. The similarities to 9-11 are remarkable and also different in a lot of ways. For instance, take a look at this next video when we show it that has all kinds of uh, horrible wreckage. The plane was shot down for 35,000 feet, you know, so it was blown up in midair, and yet most of the wreckage landed in the same area. I mean, it wasn't scattered over five miles. You could see big pieces of the airplane. You could see luggage. You could see seats. You could see bodies. You could see everything. And remember Flight 93 that crashed in Pennsylvania, supposedly, and the, the controversy about it being shot down? What I think happened was it, Flight 93 never was near Pennsylvania. It was a, some sort of a missile or something that was a diversion to 
make that whole or something. That's just an idea of mine. But the point is, at flight, I mean, at the impact site of 93, there's eyewitness testimony by experienced investigators who said that they did not find any sign of a crash at all. And of course, the excuse was that it went down the mine shaft and it was technically impossible to retrieve any of it. Which reminds me, doesn't the NTSB investigate all airplane crashes? Oh, how come they didn't investigate any of the ones on 9-11, huh? <laughs> I wonder why. You know, normally they p collect every single piece and rebuild it in a warehouse somewhere. Well, anyway, while, I was, while this was breaking news, I was just sitting there, oh my God, and a, a commercial airliner flying over a war zone? Give me a break. They, at the slightest hint of danger, they reroute those airplanes. But in this case, they rerouted it into the danger zone, and it got shot down. Who would have expected that in a, in a, in a zone where both sides had missiles capable of 35, 40,000 feet? So I looked at the reporting, and it was interesting to see how CNN and NBC both had their experts exactly like on 9-11, remember, right away within minutes after the the accident, they knew who did it, they knew what weapon was used, they explained how the weapon was used, I mean, how it affects, and so on, and I switched over to ABC to see their contemptible news, and of course, they were even worse than the other ones, because they already, they put across a big banner on the bottom that said, Malaysian commercial aircraft shot down by Russian missile! They already, you know, both sides had Russian missiles. So that doesn't tell you who did it. But the banner is typical of the propaganda. that they've, They're already conditioning everybody to think Russia did it. Now, I don't know who did it. We don't know yet. It, it has to be investigated, which is another good point. Obama wants the war to stop so we can send the NTSB guys in to investigate that. Ha! Huh? We don't even bother with our own tragedies to send the NTSB now, 9-11. As far as I know, anyway... But by golly, we want to send it to Russia, the National Trans... That's, that's our organization, not the world's organization. But Obama thinks we should stop the war there. In the meantime, don't look at what's happening here with the, with the deliberate design importing all these uh, people from Guatemala and everywhere, the children. They're, they're paying to bring them in. They're organizing the trains full and bringing them in without so much as a single inspection of who's there as they come through and reporters who ask questions are being arrested that's what what they're doing is okay the immigrant surge comes in and I'm getting off track but anyway the immigrant surge comes in they put them in these temporary camps which are our FEMA camps that are being opened up that gives them the reason to fully organize the FEMA camps and the next step is us of course Okay, but anyway, we're going to go straight to this. This is an InfoWars clip with David Knight, uh, and he's going to talk about those similarities between Flight 93 and the Malaysian shootdown and, you know, other things. It's about nine minutes. Enjoy. We'll be right back and talk about Israel. Remember that uh, even though it was largely ignored in the American press because it happened right after September 11th in 2001, it was back in October of 2001 that the Ukrainians actually did shoot down a Russian airliner over the Black Sea. And it took them nine days to admit it, but going back to this Guardian article in uh, 12th of October 2001, they say a Ukrainian official today admitted that his country's military may have mistakenly shot down a Russian commercial airliner over the Black Sea last week, killing all 78 people on board. And they went on to say, the reason for the crash could be an unintentional hit by an S-200 missile during Ukrainian air defense exercises. Well, they didn't need to have a Buk missile system. They could have shot it down with an S-200. Who knows what kind of missile shot it down if it was, in fact, shot down by a missile. I mean, it could have been blown up by a terrorist bomb on board. But note that they said that this happened, they think, by mistake during a Ukrainian air defense missile drill. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like something that happened in America 18 years ago on this very day, July 17th, 1996? Well, that's what... Anderson Cooper said on CNN, here's his comment. 
No doubt about it. I want to go to our Ben Wiedemann, who's in Gaza City. Before I do, I just want to correct something I said regarding the plane crash earlier. I said that today was the anniversary of uh, flight uh, TWA 800 uh, crashing off the coast of Long Island in 1996. I believe I said uh, it was shot down. Obviously, the government said it was a uh, center fuel tank explosion, uh, though some people had indicated they saw a rocket. There's no, uh, no evidence of that. Uh, it was ruled to be a center fuel tank explosion, so I apologize for, uh, for misspeaking about that anniversary. That was his retraction. Earlier, he had said and just moved on that Flight 800 was shot down on this same day in 1996. Over 200 people were killed in that incident. And there were many, many eyewitnesses. It was just a year ago, remember, that Yahoo News covered and we put up on Infowars.com that TWA Flight 800 crash was not due to a gas tank explosion, says former investigators. Now, this is an article about a documentary that was about to be released a year ago. And they said six former investigators who took part in the film say there was a cover-up and they want the case reopened. This is a senior accident investigator for the National Transportation Safety Board who said... There was a lack of coordination and willful denial of information. He said there were 755 witnesses to Flight 800, TWA Flight 800. At no time was any of their information provided by the witnesses shared by the FBI with the National Transportation Safety Board. Jim Spear, an accident investigator at the time of the crash for the Airline Pilots Association, who shifted through the recovered wreckage in a hangar, said he discovered holes consistent with those that would have been formed by a high-energy blast in the right wing. He requested that it be tested for explosives. When the test came back positive for explosives, he was physically removed from the room by two CIA agents. So before we jump into war, let's understand that the Ukraine actually did, in 2001, actually did shoot down a Russian airliner. They admitted it. They said it was an accident, that it flew over an area where they were having naval exercises. We have 755 witnesses who actually saw a missile going towards Flight 800. We have pilots who said they saw a flare going up into the plane for Flight 800. And yet our government lied about that and they covered that up. And yet our government knows exactly what the missile was and who fired it within just a short period of time in the Ukraine. I don't think we need to take that very seriously, but let's look at something else that touches on government lies about plane crashes. Let's take a look at the pictures of this plane crash. Now remember, this is a plane crash that as of this moment, everyone agrees it was hit by a missile at about 30,000 feet in the air, broke up in the air and crashed to the ground. And I want you to take a look at the pictures online at this crash site and compare the pictures of this crash site in the Ukraine where we have a plane that exploded at 30,000 feet and then hit the ground. We had a lot of witnesses say they saw it come in. I want you to compare that to Flight 93 that we're told drove straight into the ground that did not explode in midair. Now, at this plane site in Malaysia, they, have, they said they've had at least 100 bodies that have been found so far at the scene. Wreckage has spread across an area of about nine miles in diameter. Now, when we go back and we look at the Flight 93 crash, what happened there, there were three debris fields, actually. Uh, sorry, make that four if you count the engine. In addition to the primary crash site, there were two other large debris fields separated by miles. In this case, it was about eight miles. So in the case of the plane today, it was about a nine-mile radius for the crash debris. In the case of Flight 93, it was about eight miles. And if you look at the pictures of the crash sites, you see that there is one primary crash site on this map. And then there's an engine located a good distance away from that. And then two other major debris fields, about the same size as United Flight 93, which we're told hit the ground. But now, of course, there were airplane parts there. Were there any airplane parts at the Pentagon? We were told that a plane flew into the Pentagon, flew into a building, and completely vaporized, completely disappeared. That building was more destructive to the plane than a plane flying directly into the ground. That simply is not believable. It's not believable from the size of the hole at the Pentagon either. So compare the information that you're getting, compare the summaries and the conclusions that they have arrived at that fit their political agenda, compare that to the stories that we've heard previously, stories that have also
fit a political agenda. Stories about planes on 9-11, stories about Flight 800 and TWA. My friends, Alex Jones here to tell you about some of the most important information concerning you and your family's health. Radiation. <laughs> Commercials, so yeah, we're not supposed to show commercials. And now, what I've got behind me is my own website. Oh, one more disclaimer: as a member of Architects and Engineers, um, we don't talk about what really happened at the Pentagon. I don't believe there's enough information, although there are suspicious things, like the hole that goes all the way through is not uh, something that you'd expect an airliner to do. But they all need answers, and they're withholding 84 videos. So, you know, we, we don't necessarily have the same opinions that InfoWars has on some, on a lot more subjects. But now, let's get to the Israeli invasion of the uh, Gaza prison colony. And over the last few days, I made myself the villain of the Middle East because I didn't think about how widely my words might be read and what I wrote something in response to an Israeli uh, I was watching a video of the Israelis justifying attacking Gaza and they were talking about how their people were terrified I mean the Israeli citizens were terrified and they was talking about how I mean the main thing that got me was we have a right to protect our country don't we and so I wrote this, this thing. Well, this is the page I'm on, and you can, you can see right here, this little slip. Go ahead and put that o over me now. And I, this is my sarcastic letter that I wrote. A as if I was an Israeli, I wrote this. The people in Gaza brought it on themselves by their own actions. They insisted on throwing rocks and sticks at the heavily armored IDF troops occupying their lands. The Palestinians took away all chances for peace when they started firing a merciless barrage of those overgrown pop bottle rockets over the walls of their prison colony into the sovereign state of Israel. Although they were totally ineffective, Israel had to retaliate against the civilian population as a matter of policy to send a message that Israel will not tolerate any resistance to Israeli authorities. Then I go on to say, we had to bomb their hospitals, water, and power systems. We had no alternative to using the internationally banned weapons like burning phosphorus. We had to destroy civilian homes, bomb schools, and other civilian infrastructure to protect the people of Israel. We had to saturation bomb Gaza with missiles and planes for hours upon hours. They left us no choice. We have to blockade Buck blockade Gaza to prevent food, medicine, and international aid from reaching the children. They could grow up to be Hamas terrorists, you know. We have the right to protect ourselves. We are not the aggressors. So don't criticize Israel. Blame the Palestinians for their vicious, unjustified, and unprovoked attacks on the innocent people of Israel. Okay, now, you can bring me back now. I just got to say, well, I'm gonna let, let me go down and find some of the comments that I was getting. Let's see if I can get that, bring that up. I'm sure I got them here. Um, there, yeah, this is a good one, I think. If I, I'll just, I'll pull this up. This is the, this is the actual video, right here. Oh, you don't get to hear the audio. We've got Peter Lerner on the line. He's from the IDF. Let's talk to him briefly, shall we? Uh, Mr. Lerner, thanks for being uh, with us. You're live on RT International. We appreciate your time. Um, oh, I wanted to put to you, significantly more Palestinians than, than Israelis have been injured or killed in this operation, mainly civilians. What is your view on that? What's the Israeli view on this as we see so many civilians' death? It's gone past 200 now in Gaza. The IDF operation is ongoing in order to restore safety and security for the State of Israel. Hamas decided to have an onslaught against against the State of Israel, <laughs> and indeed, even when See, we held our I was watching this. They decided to attack Israel. Now, as they continue.
continued to bombard Israel um, indiscriminately, and we were left indiscriminately. But it isn't kind of fighting like for like, is it? I'm sure you're taking no pleasure in this at all. Not for one million am I suggesting that, but you've got an iron dome. Most of your uh, uh, residents in Israel have got somewhere to hide to. That's not the case in Gaza. He's a it's good, kind of in, a good like questioner. Like, is it? Should you not have held back a bit more to try and maybe negotiate a bit more? Well, indeed, uh, Hamas showed no will, no intentions, and showed quite the opposite. Israel was you know, basically sitting on the sidelines. We were in uh, standby for six hours, and indeed they could, they bombarded us and and uh, and did not show any sign of any intentions to stop that. Okay, uh, uh, so this is, that's enough of that. But now, leave, go ahead and leave everything the way it is. Um, now, let me scroll down a little bit and show you some. I'm trying to show you the comments. Let's see. Here we go. Now, okay, uh, first of all, I got this one right here from V Playlisted, and he talks about people with dementia have trouble with sarcasm, and writing in plain language more often might enable, okay, well, I took that as being kind of an arbitrary, well, I took it as macabre humor, first of all, calling people who might read this, people with dementia, but uh, he told me that voicing my opinion in such an aggressive manner might not bring on any good for the platform, you know, and I, I answered him back kind of in no, no, no question what I was saying. I, I told him, bite his lip, you know, the next time you think about telling somebody how to be an activist, you know, blah, 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 and I, I was kind of mad, and, and then... I started getting answers to my sarcasm. Let's see if I can find one here. Uh, well, heck, this one isn't one that has the comment on it. Oh, maybe I, well, anyway, let's just put it this way. You can bring me back so, you, so that people can see me. And basically, I'm going to stand over here now. Because we, we're going to open up the phone lines in just a minute, not... Not yet. You go ahead and take the number, but we want you, we're going to play another video first before we do open the phone lines, before we answer the phone lines. Uh, but mostly from people in the Middle East who, who really didn't understand that it was sarcasm at all, uh, they were saying things like, Die, devil dog, you Israeli Nazi! You know, and then another one was more polite, but he was saying, what would you do if they did this to your children? You know, and stuff like that. Well, th that's what I was saying. I had to spend a long, long time writing back to everybody, telling them what, what it was. Now, like, here's one, this, this one called Spacer Boy. Go, just put key two over the top of it, if you can. And so, show this again, back to where you were. Um... Well, let me, I'll just read it. You can leave it there. Uh, here, sarcasm doesn't work on everybody, so here it is in plain language. And I had to send this to everybody, with, and to the ones that got mad at me, I, I sent it with an apology that I distressed them further since they had already either undergone uh, you know, injustices or experienced frustration by trying to uh, get people to listen and getting you know, a response that even drives them crazier. But here, here it is in plain language for those of you who don't understand that sarcasm, which I don't expect my TV listeners have a problem with it, but uh, especially the way I read it. But here's it in plain language. Israel is a large, massively armed military force that surrounds, occupies, and controls a tiny population of decimated, unarmed, innocent, conquered Palestinians and has deprived them of all their human rights and basic necessities, stripped them of their homes and property, then confined them in an enclosed concentration camp type of penal colony or prison colony, and to claim that the Palestinians are the villains and that Israel is an innocent victim of terrorism is not only ridiculous, more accurately, it's an outright lie. Okay, so when I sent that to the Middle East people that I'd offended, 
a lot of them got, you know, a newfound respect for, for what I was trying to say. And I, I sent another thing to him saying, hey, look, it's the sociopaths in our government that believe in perpetual war and the people of America are basically good, but we are captive of a system that includes massive government propaganda that results in a situation where would you believe that most of the people in the United States actually believe we are a force for good, truth, and justice when that has never been the truth and less now than ever before? And so that, and that also, a lot of Israelis are decent people. There, there's a very large percentage of their population, in comparison to ours especially, that is anti-war and understands fully that Israel is the aggressor and violating all kinds of human rights violations and international laws. And the only reason that they don't have more of the UN sanctions against them is that the United States keeps, with veto power, keeps vetoing you know, the common sense resolutions, allowing this not just aggression, wars of aggression seem to be our specialty, but not anymore. Um, now, I want to put a little aside here. I lived in Israel for a year and a half when I was a child, I, in seventh grade. I was in Israel when Kennedy got killed. So I come back to the United States, and then I see Martin Luther King uh, get killed, uh, Bobby Kennedy, Malcolm X. One after another, the decent people got killed. And it didn't take long to understand that, you know, when you see that nobody tried to find who did it. They, they instantly protected themselves and the power structure that, that did those assassinations. There being, you know, today we kind of know what happened. All the unclassified documents are showing that, you know, CIA hit squads got them all. Uh, and, and it becomes pretty easy to see that we're not the force for truth and justice anywhere, not even in our own country. So, anyway, uh, let's play, this is a clip from the Real News Network with Paul Jay, one of the better places you can go for news and analysis. And they're interviewing a woman blogger who was in Gaza at the time of the attack, uh, when Israel attacked them. And this is a, an interview with her. And see if you can't connect to her point of view. My God, the children go out to play. The Israelis are coming. Where do you go? Where do you evacuate to? My God, you, you're so afraid that you won't have any children coming home. Go ahead. Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. On Thursday, Israel launched a ground invasion along with the air attack on Gaza. They say they're targeting tunnels that link Gaza to Israel that were used by a Hamas force to invade Israel. So, uh, invasion, I guess, is the word coming out of the official statements of Israel. A small, a small a few people of Hamas entered those tunnels and were stopped by the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, at any rate, Israeli ground troops have now entered the fray in Gaza, and now joining us to talk about all of this, first of all joining us from Gaza, is Nalan al Saraj. She's a Gaza-based blogger. And also joining us from Israel is Leah Terachansky. She's an Israeli-Canadian journalist. She's our real news correspondent in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. Thank you both for joining us. Nalan, uh, tell us uh, what's happening there today. What are you observing? What's the mood there? Um, I'm standing in my balcony right now, which is very dangerous, but I'm trying to see what's happening to my people in my city. Uh, there is fire in multiple places, uh, a little bit further from my area, which is kind of rare at night, because usually my area has been target is get targeted multiple times at night. Um, they're basically targeting in north and east. Uh, I got some calls from f some friends in east uh, having uh, to evacuate. Um, I can see from my uh, balcony uh, smoke and fire, and the sky is, is going in colors, uh, yellow and red. It's going crazy. It's very terrifying. I could hear the explosions uh, near and far. 
um, for the last couple of hours, it was crazy. Um, the battleships were going crazy for the, the last couple of hours as well. So it's not only by um, uh, airplanes like uh, F-16s and Apaches and also battleships are uh, been used um, uh, heavily this tonight. Uh, just in less uh, than 15 minutes, I heard more than 20 uh, hits, uh, multiple places as well. This is artillery fire, fire from the battleships. Yes, yes. Um, and um, I got some friends in, in north. Uh, uh, they're evacuating, and uh, uh, it's very scary over there. Um, that ground invasion is started, and uh, everybody's so scared, and... Um, we don't know where to go. This is the huge problem, and we don't know what to do as well. It's uh, we're what what it's kind scary. of what kind of uh, buildings or housing was targeted in your area? What have you seen? Um, for example, um, uh, two days ago, the building next to mine was targeted, and it was it was crazy. There was injuries and fire and smoke and um, children screaming everywhere. Um, um, what kind of them? They're they're basically civilians. Um, today, at the, the the couple of hours of the truce, I went to the hospital just to support the, the my people, my brothers and sisters who've been injured through this massacres. And mostly they're injured. And I talked to a couple of doctors to understand more what's happening. And they say more than fifty percent of the injuries are women and children, and and most of the injuries are civilians. So. Um, they're targeting homes, they're targeting, they're destroying homes and dreams and, and a lot of hope that we tried to build through all these years. The house that was targeted next to you, why, why was it targeted? Um, um, I don't know actually, but a couple of people just talking that maybe uh, pe people who live over there, they have some relations with Hamas, but th this also doesn't make any sense because uh, you're talking about Gaza Strip where people have different uh, pony views and different uh, parties that they support. So uh, just uh, having some relations with Hamas doesn't mean that you should be targeted or your house be destroyed because more than 50% uh, or 60% people over here, they support Hamas. So um, they've been uh, legally elected. So what's the plan next? Are you going to just target buildings? Because... I'm talking about the building next to me because where I live, it's a very crowded area. So um, if they're going to target buildings like this in areas like this, so and it's it's ne it's nowhere next to uh, safe or uh, there's no like no um, uh, logical excuse for this. Right. Now, now Lana, are there in the area where you live, are there any rockets being fired from there? Uh, rockets being fired. Yeah, to, uh, into Israel from anywhere in the area where they, you've seen the Israelis bombing. Um, I can't really know. Um, mostly when this happens, it's, it's, it's rarely, I guess, uh, comparing to the explosions that I hear from the other side. So um, you can't really know, um, especially in nights, because um, Israel um, focuses on... in on freak us, uh, freaking us out um, and not letting us sleep, I guess. Um, so comparing the explosions and the rockets, it it's, doesn't make any sense. And what's been the impact on people of the death of the four young cousins, the four children on the beach? Oh my God, this is the most heartbreaking story, even though there is a lot of heartbreaking stories as well, like homes and families, a total family been been killed, but those children... Um, I actually met one of the children that was were playing with them uh, today at the hospital uh, from the Bucker family. And, oh, my God, I was so close to crying for him, but I was trying to stay strong and I'm telling him, um, don't surrender, just pray for them. They're in a better place. But believe me, what's happening over here, it's, it's killing all the dreams for the children over here. I'm actually worried that one day... Uh, my children would 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 be dead in this uh, brutal way. Um, it's nothing related to humanity. There's no excuse for all what they're doing. Not only for the four children, but um, in their case, it was the most horrible situation because all what they're doing was that they wanted to play, and 
I don't think Israel likes that anymore. Right, Leah, this is the, the death of the four young boys on the beach has broken through international media. Even the New York Times had a big photograph of the children just after they were killed. Uh, what, what impact has, has it had, if any, in Israel? Almost none, Paul. What we see here, in fact, is that the only discussion that happens about the killing of these four boys is that it makes Israel look bad. We haven't seen any actual deploring on behalf of uh, the public or politician on any kind of level that will make a difference. Uh, and what we're hearing again and again in the Israeli press, in the, in the army radio, and from the government is that if civilians are killed, they're killed because Hamas is using them as a, as a human shield. Now, to add something to Nalan's point from earlier, during the last ground operation uh, in Operation Cast Lead, uh, one of the first big uh, killings was of a police station in, in, inside the Gaza Strip. Um, dozens of police officers who were just graduating that day were killed. Now, the government explained it as they are Hamas, but Hamas is the government in the Gaza Strip, which means anybody who works in the government is a member of Hamas by default. So this argument basically says that anyone who has a, civ civilian jo a civil job in the government is a legitimate target. Uh, now, here in Israel, tomorrow, they're going to demolish the homes of the two people that they're accusing of killing the three uh, settlers who were killed, uh, the three teenagers who were uh, kidnapped uh, that started this whole escalation. Meanwhile, they haven't yet presented any evidence that these two people are actually responsible for the kidnapping and killing of these teenagers, uh, but they're already going and demolishing their houses tomorrow. Uh, this is an another example of how it doesn't matter what the excuse is, it doesn't matter what the evidence is, they're going to go and punish them. Meanwhile, the, the six Israelis who kidnapped uh, in revenge a Palestinian teenager their houses are not going to be demolished, of course. Now, the, what's, in terms of the overall mood there, you witnessed uh, a, a protest and a counter-protest. Uh, what, what, describe what you saw. So today, the Israeli organization Breaking the Silence, which is a group of veterans of the Israeli army who record uh, an anonymous testimonies of soldiers talking about the daily occupation and the daily violations of human rights, just describing what they've done in their army. And they've collected thousands of uh, testimonies over the years. Uh, and about once a month lately, they've been going in the middle of the Tel Aviv uh, Habima Square, um, the, a place that it has a very strong history of protests. And they today they were just ha inviting soldiers, veterans, to read their own testimonies of violations of human rights from their time in the army. About a thousand people came to support them and for just to, to protest the war. Not everyone is a clear supporter of breaking the silence. Um, but anyway, there were about a thousand people there and they were chanting, uh, no, no, fascism will not pass and Jews and Arabs refuse to be enemies and not in my name uh, and the killing. חשוב לומר, אנחנו מילואימניקים, מנסים לחזור הביתה כמה שיותר בשלום. אתה לא רוצה להיפגע, אתה לא רוצה שיקרה משהו. כפועל יוצא, אנחנו גם יותר זהירים בהפעלת האש. אנחנו לא רוצים להתחיל משהו שיגרום לנו להיתקע שם. מילואימניקים באופן כללי הם יותר זהירים. הם, לוקחים סיכונים, הם לא לוקחים סיכונים מיותרים. מבחינת הוראות פתיחה באש, לא קיבלנו הוראות לראות הכל דבר שזז, אבל קיבלנו הוראה כללית, שאם אתה מרגיש איום, לראות. תגמרו לנו שזאת מלחמה, ואין מקום לשיקולים. תגידו שזה לא ביטחון שוטף, ולא מציאות של שטחים. זו פעולה מלחמתית, ואין הגבלות על הירי. who has been inciting against left-wing uh, left uh, activists for weeks. And about on Saturday, when there was another anti-war demonstration in uh, Tel Aviv, he called his supporters, who are known to be very right-wing, to come and beat up those activists. So they came, they protested against them, and when the sirens for rockets started, um, the police disappeared and they beat a lot of them. Two of them ended up in, in the hospital. So to, at today's demonstration, when it was clear that they're going, that they're going to come out in numbers again, there was a, a lot of police in the place, and they actually managed to stop the violence um, from uh, taking place. And there was about 500 of them. Uh, and what what of was the, the slogans they were shouting? So this, this group of uh, neo-fascists are followers of Rabbi Kahane, who was a rabbi here, a uh, former member of parliament, who believed that all the Palestinians should either be expelled um, or gotten rid of. And so they were, yelling, they were chanting, death to Arabs, uh, we want to burn down your villages, Muhammad is dead. So, 
I filmed some of it, and you can see in the, in the coming clip that they're yelling, Muhammad is dead and death to Arabs. Okay, here, we're going to roll the clip now. <laughs> And this is a clip of the anti-war demonstration. People are yelling, not in my name. Okay. Uh, Nalan, let's go back to the, the mood in Gaza. I mean, what do you think is the objective of the Israelis here? They're not, it doesn't seem like they have any seriousness about actually reoccupying Gaza. The, the ground invasion so far, at least, they say are targeting these tunnels. Um, so, so the bombings, which have mostly killed civilians, uh, I, I don't know the exact number now, I believe we're over 200, are we not? Uh, what do you think is their objective? Uh, my point of view from all these years, I think um, Israel needs Hamas to stay in Gaza Strip. So they could tell the world that we have um, a Muslim terrorist party over here next to us, our neighbors, and we're so... Um, uh, terrified and we're so in danger. We need you to support us all the time. We need you to uh, be our side. And, and what's happening over here in this operation is the the actual proof for what I'm saying. So uh, they're killing more than uh, 200 people, civilians. There are more than uh, hun uh, thousands of injuries, and nobody is breaking the silence. Nobody is doing anything for us. And why? Because Israel has one reason that there is Hamas in Gaza Strip and um, with them breaking all the laws and with them breaking all the human rights nobody's is trying to stop them because this is the main reason this is the the only ally they have and everybody's believing them so I think if Israel wanted to um, stop Hamas from being in Gaza Strip they could um, just do it in one night. They have the strongest army, right? But they don't need that. They just want to uh, terrorize us. They want to keep us um, uh, to remember that uh, Israel is always going to be there. Israel is the occupation. Israel will never let us have peace. And um, and all of that because you have Hamas. When when actually um, after what happened uh, recently with Hamas and Fatah, the unity, and Hamas been backing uh, uh, down a little bit on the government system and giving a lot of um, and cooperation uh, with uh, the situation over here. So Israel has no reason to do what they're doing over here. But I think uh, with all their forces, uh, they just want to. Um, kill over here they want to um keep us um in this blockade they want to um kill our dreams they want us just to stay but, where but, we but the, the argument the israelis are giving is that it's because of hamas rockets f being fired and that they have to stop uh, and you can hear even some you know relatively progressive israelis saying that no country would allow itself to be have these rockets fired upon upon his, itself without retaliating. Uh, what's what is do you think most people's opinion of the firing of the rockets okay, in, first, in Gaza? First of all, uh, the Palestinians been resisting uh, since forever. Uh, we will never forget that Israel is an occupation. It's not a country to us. It's an occupation. So uh, we will be resisting in all the ways and all the means that we could uh, afford. Um, if you've been holding your own son uh, dead or in, in pieces uh, in your own arms, would you forget it? Would you just let it go because Israel wants you to let it go? I don't think so. What's happening over here is massacres. Uh, children are losing their families, their homes. Everybody, you know, all your home in one second is destroyed with all the memories and all your... All your um, uh, years is destroyed how could you just get over it and, and just stop resisting just because israel wants that it's uh, the rockets uh, compared to what they're uh, what israel is doing is nothing they're using the most massive and uh, heavy weapons in the world on civilians so how is this even make sense uh, just because uh, we're resisting in multiple ways not only with rockets we're resisting with social media we're resisting with media we're resisting with 
just um, trying to be alive. This is the way that we will stay resisting. So um, um, this will never happen. That will never end. It's this is our way and this is our method in life as Palestinians. We will never surrender for the occupation. Um, so whatever they're saying um, compared to what they're actually doing is lies. If they really want peace and if they really want to uh, negotiate in, in, in actual conditions and actual life standards, they will never be killing us till now. Um, and they should understand that we'll stay resistant until uh, our last breaths because we believe this is our land and we have to fight for the people who've died all these years for this land and for the actual principles for a human being to have freedom. Okay, Leah, there's a breaking report here about just what's going on on the ground in Gaza. What is it? This, this very moment, the it was asked to uh, send another 18,000 reservists to the south of the Gaza Strip. The spokesperson of the IDF, Colonel Moti al uh spoke to the press saying that large uh, ground forces are currently accompanying a massive operation by the Israeli air, uh, air and naval forces. Uh, they're going to be taking over large swaths of land in the Gaza Strip, and they're acting against the tunnels and other targets, meaning that he's opening the door to any, any target that will come. Uh, the uh, Israeli uh, chief of staff of the army, Benny Ganatz, also said that uh, they're requesting that the civilians in the Gaza Strip evacuate. Uh, Nalan, uh, they're suggesting civilians uh, evacuate in the Gaza Strip. Where, where, are you, where are you supposed to go? I have no clue where to go. And actually, I have some friends in South and East. They're evacuating right now. I got some calls and some friends are just so freaking out. We don't know where they could go or even us if the uh, ground... Uh, um, invasion would go further than the south and east. Um, I don't know where to go. Okay. Leah and Nalan, thanks very much for joining us. No problem. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Yeah, on The Real News Network with Paul J. Go check it out. TRRN.com. And, uh, well, while we were looking at that video, I went ahead and put up on the screen, you can see some of the answers I got. I, I put that same comment, that sarcastic thing, like I was an Israeli supporting the slaughter. I mean, as if I was blind to the idea that it was slaughter. Well, here's the, the like, here, this first one here, Johnny Chimpo. I'm not saying this is one of the ones from the Middle East, but Johnny Chimpo. He says, yeah, peace in their concentration camps run by Israel. Are you that blind? Well, 32 people thought that was a good comment. And then... Um, you go down the list, let's see, I got down, there's a guy named Moshe Dayan who gave me a lot of shit, but, oh, excuse me, I mean a lot of fecal matter. <laughs> oh, did I turn this on? I got this on, don't I? Am I muted? We're okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've, I've been muting and unmuting. I, I should have realized they would have told me by now. Uh, but anyway, let me find the, the good one here. Uh, oh. There, this one here from S Samir al Kayal. It says, bring back to the Palestinians their land, and then you can do something like all the shit on you and your destiny. Well, I, ha I wrote back to him and apologized to him. And uh, others, let's see if I can find another one. Um, it's, it's amazing. When people got off on tangents, I see there talking about Auschwitz and whatnot, but gosh, I had some good ones in here. Attack, oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> this guy named Numlock, I don't know where he comes from, but uh, he wrote a long letter here, you know, describing everything that's actually happening to the Palestinians. He got it right, lands were illegally given to him and so on. Then, then this guy comes back. Um, Stop your bullshit propaganda, racist moron. Another one. Oh, shut it if you coward Zionist clown. You know, you can see that they don't have a lot of, uh, of English. I, I ha you know, earlier I told you that that guy gave me the advice about not being so sarcastic. And, but, he, you know, and he worded it like it was for people with dementia. No, it's also for people that don't have the, the best handle on English. And I wrote the guy an apology.
for, for telling him, you know, the next time you feel like telling somebody how to be an activist, bite your lip. Well, I wrote him an apology and told him, man, sometimes what looks like capricious and arbitrary interference might actually be sage advice, and I'm sorry that I failed to recognize the wisdom of your words. Because I made the entire Middle East hate me as if I was, you know, one of those Israeli fascist Nazis. And I was being sarcastic, so, you know, I was trying to be as outrageous as possible so that people would understand the situation. Now yesterday when we were doing a growing concern with Jim Lockhart, we did a show on the Palestinian-Israeli connection. Go ahead and put, take off key two. And people go ahead and call in if you have anything to say. We got seven or eight minutes left. And anyway, a guy called in and he was kind of upset that we were, you know, he said we were trashing Israel and he wanted, you know, he wanted it to stop. He didn't think it was reasonable, you know, and, and I just said to him, I said, man, we're not trashing Israel. We're reporting somebody doing war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes against decency, unprovoked attacks. I mean, they shot pop bottle. No, they, they were bouncing rocks off of the tanks. We had to annihilate the whole city. Yeah, you know, oh, those rocks were bouncing off. This is about the time I should play uh, Blood on the Wire by Jackson Brown with that video behind it. You know, they pick up a brick or a rock or a stone. Yeah, those are real aggressors. And, and here's another thing. Israel cannot surround people, barric barricade them in their homes, slaughter them, embargo ships that are coming in with medicine and then say that we're in desperate fear from those same people you got them surrounded you got them in a penal colony and you're afraid your people are deathly afraid you're lying sacks of shit anyway Go ahead, if that Israeli supporter is still out there, call up and tell me how you can justify such wanton slaughter for bouncing rocks off of a tank. Or, as they keep saying, oh, they shot rockets at us. These are nothing more than pop bottle rockets. They are not guided missiles. They fire them off and they go, pow! You know, and they might hurt somebody if they land near them. But it's not like firing the barrage from... The Navy vessels that Israel has is constantly barraging from the west side. And from the east side, they've got their uh, artillery bar barraging. In the meantime, they got the airplanes flying over, dropping bombs. And now they had 40,000 troops invading this place. And these people are unarmed. Unarmed. And what are they destroying? Schools, roads, water systems, power systems. So... Anyway, I see that you Israel supporters are too cowardly now that I've called you on this. You know, you have no leg to stand on. This is wanton brutality, and I'm a former Israeli supporter. I lived in Israel, and I swore I'd go back there to live because it, was, it, it had the people with the best attitudes. But you know who those people were? Those were the original oppressed Europeans. I'm not talking about the people in the power structure that seem to be sociopaths wherever you go. But the people there were actual decent people that cared about humanity. Children could walk for miles at night without being molested or harmed, and you expect them to get where they're going, no problem. But guess what? Their children grew up to be bastards. I mean, really, no good, evil people. The most fascist people on earth is what they grew up to be. They were privileged. They began to think that everything about their life should be privileged and, and was privileged. And I, I finally, you know, that was it. I swore I wouldn't go back. And I'm, I'm never going back. They, they betrayed my love for peace. They betrayed my love for decency. And this is the country that you guys are, oh yeah, the, the holy land, right? The only thing holy about these people, I don't know, <laughs> I can't even think of a good analogy offhand. It's, it's, it's too terrible. And I'm not a Jew hater. Now, let me tell you something. Although the people in Israel are good, decent people, for the most part, I mean, they could have been, but they're under a really bad propaganda system where they're convinced that Palestinians are evil and all that sort of stuff. 
uh, and these are, I'm talking about the young kids. I saw an interview where the lady was cheering all the bombing and death that was going on over there, and and then she kind of paused for a minute, kind of a little moment of embarrassment, and said, I guess I'm kind of a fascist. Kind of a fascist? Well, you're a, you're a totalitarian uh, and an anti-humanitarian. Let's put it that way. You've lost touch with your humanity. And uh, it's just absolutely sickening to see that happen. But, you know, we have the same thing here. We saw that on 9-11 when everybody went Muslim crazy, and they're still doing it. And not only that, even though now we know they had nothing to do with it, we're still doing things like putting people with Muslim-sounding names on a no-fly list. We're still doing things like uh, letting the TSA pat down everybody, even though they've never stopped a single terrorist act. <laughs> Can you imagine when they finally do stop? If they finally stopped a terrorist act, they'd have to say, We did! We did stop one! Yeah, right, but you groped 50 million people in the meantime. Yeah, let's see if Bin Laden's hiding in your vagina. Okay. It, it's just absolutely ridiculous that, that we allow the TSA to exist. Although I do use it when we're doing blogs on the internet and I get one of these trolls, I tell them, man, you're wasting your time. If you, if you like to abuse people, why don't you start working for the TSA where, you know, if somebody backtalks you, not only can you detain him, but you can grope his genitals. You can open his luggage and take his whatever's cool, whatever you like, take it. And then you can report him to Homeland Security as a security threat and take, put him on the no-fly list, really screw with his life. And all because you're a petty, no-good bully. But hey, just to show there's no hard feelings, you can use me as a character reference. Okay. Uh, so I, I do like, you know, playing with irony and sarcasm sometimes. But uh, let's just put it this way. This is not rocket science. By now, I mean, I keep... Re I, everybody should be aware of the techniques they're using. It's perpetual war machine, and they have to completely get us on the side of, of the war that they're choosing and starting all over the place. And, and I can't believe that we still have people that... Oh, really? These guys are bad guys? Well, then I'm against them. I think we should kill them. And... You know, instead we should say, you know, prove it. When, when, oh, Anderson, we got 50 seconds left. I want to say this one thing. Uh, Anderson Cooper is a known CIA agent. Now, that's not the, what I wanted to tell you. That's the premise. I mean, that's the beginning of it. He was talking about the Malaysian flight, and he referenced it back to flight 800 off the East Coast. And he said, yeah, flight 800, that was shot down off the East Coast. Well, then, the next day, he came back with a retraction. He said, I, by mistake, I said Flight 800 was shot down when the fuel tank in the middle of the plane actually exploded. So I apologize for misspeaking. No, he was a CIA agent. He knew what happened. He said what happened. And then he came back because you can't remember all your lies. He forgot that that was a lie. Okay, so see you next Saturday.